Good morning. Welcome to the APP Group uh, Briefing. We have with us the, not only the Chairman uh, Manfred Weber, but also our spokesperson in the Civil Liberties Committee, Jeroen Lennartz, uh, who will be speaking about the report on Frontex, among other things. And then we will take your questions. Chairman, please. Yeah, welcome. Thank you so much for your interest and uh, for uh, this uh, week. Let me start with, um, with uh, mentioning uh, Daphne Caruana Galicia. We had yesterday evening a debate in the European Parliament about uh, five years after uh, the assassination of uh, Daphne. We stand here uh, in the meeting room, which is named about Daphne, uh, to give us a clear idea about what she did for us in a way uh, to fight for freedom of media. Uh, last Friday, the murders of Daphne were convicted for to 40 years uh, in prison. This uh, can, for us as EPP, be only the first step. Uh, we want to make clear and we want to see results about who ordered or her killing, uh, that they also should go to prison. Um, we will not rest until justice uh, uh, is done. Uh, and I will not mention any kind of party, because that is for us a joint effort as a parliament, as uh, Democrats, that we fight for this. Well, this week, obviously, the most important thing is uh, uh, the European Council in front of us and the uh, European answer towards the energy crisis. This is our contribution to the war in Ukraine, that we overcome the winter in front of us, the tough winter in front of us. Um, the next month will be extremely challenging, and I have to underline that we have already politically speaking, a lost summer uh, in, in, in mind, uh, that uh, the last month were already months of intensive discussions, but no concrete outcome. And today's speculation, today's uh, uh, high energy costs are already, already driven by the lack uh, of our member states to find a common understanding on the energy side. That's why it's high time to now decide. Uh, for uh, the European uh, Council, it's important to give a clear signal of unity as European member states. Our answer is clear. We have, first of all, to save energy. I think that is clear. We need a binding mechanism of solidarity. Currently, we are talking about voluntary uh, uh, measures. We need a binding mechanism on solidarity, especially on the gas storage, that this is uh, jointly used. We need a price cap in the issues where we have an irresponsible development on the market side. And we need, and that's the most important message for us as EPP, we need a real energy market in today's European Union. When you see the debates between Spain and France about the interconnector uh, on, the, on, the, on the gas, on the gas uh, uh, infrastructure, then it is not what we need. It's the opposite of what Europe needs. We need a real energy market that would make Europe uh, really uh, powerful to give an answer on global stage. Let me underline again that in all these developments, in all these proposals, we regret, and I as EPP leader also criticize, that the European Commission is using one, Article 122. Um, uh, this article is excluding the European Parliament from the legislative process. That is not the democratic way of doing things, and that's why uh, the Commission should not get used, in a way, to use this emergency mechanism. In all the efforts uh, linked to COVID, the European Parliament was always ready to deliver in short notice, in short uh, period of time. That's why there is no practical argument to exclude this and to use the 122. That is uh, for the energy question. And then let me also add that uh, there is uh, a development going on which is extremely concerning for us. And that's why I'm happy that I'm today accompanied by our coordinator in the DP committee, Jerome Lenas, um, that we are together presenting today our real concerns about the migration development over the last years. The numbers are going up. Uh, the reception capacities are already reaching their limits. And that's why we have to have a look on these developments. The EPP is the only party currently who is pushing to have an eye, to have a look on the, what is happening there. Uh, we cannot accept that next to energy crisis, next to the war on European soil, next to food crisis, we will also have a migration crisis in front of us. And that's why it's now the moment to act, and that's why we are highlighting this uh, today. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And maybe to follow up on that, on that last point uh, that was made by, by Chairman Weber, I mean, if you look at the numbers 
uh, only on the first, uh, the first nine months of this year, we had more than 228,000 irregular entries that were detected. This is 70% increase compared to last year. It's the highest total recorded since 2016. If you look at the asylum applications in the member states, we had three consecutive months with more than 70,000 applications per month. In July, we had 73,000. Also, this is, again, the first time we've seen anything like this since 2016, particularly in the Western Balkans route and the Eastern Mediterranean route, we see increases of 190 and 123 percent compared to last year. And this is a, a very concerning collection of numbers. And there is a risk that we are sleepwalking into another crisis. And the EPP, as Manfred has said, is the only group currently that is recognizing this risk. Uh, other groups are so busy pointing fingers to member states and agencies that they are blind for the reality on the ground. And when you point a finger to others, as the saying goes, you always point three at yourself. And instead of pointing fingers, we should be doing our job here in the Parliament. For years, we have complained that the Council is not doing its job, that they're too slow, that they're blocking progress. The Council at the moment is doing its job. They are making progress, they are ready to negotiate, and the Parliament is lagging behind. So instead of making party political games uh, with national member states and agencies, we should do our work on the legislative agenda for the Pact on Migration, because we need a common European asylum system, a truly working system, if we also want to help all the member states. So we need strong border controls, we need to have screening at the borders to distinguish between uh, real refugees and economic migrants, and we need effective return of those that are not in need of international protection. We need to work better with third countries on migration management, on returns and readmission, and on fighting against criminal gangs that are smuggling people and make a very cynical multi-billion dollar business model out of it. And we need to have the proper instruments to stand up against the despicable behavior of countries like Turkey and Belarus when they try to instrumentalize very vulnerable people for their own political games. I think this is what we need to do in the parliament and we need to really step up our work. And this is also why we have put this on the uh, agenda once again today. And then maybe a, a, a short remark on, on Frontex and the discharge report. Discharges in this house are supposed to be about the implementation of the budget of an agency. And anything you can read in the OLAF report or in the work of the European Court of Auditors will tell you that there is nothing wrong with the way Frontex implemented its budget. So for the discharge, this is perfectly fine. And as EPP, this is also the reason why we will fully support uh, giving discharge to Frontex. Refusing a discharge is, is a political statement. Let me rephrase that it's a political game. It's a political game played by those forces in this House that do not like Frontex as an agency and that are allergic to border management in the first place because I believe Europe should roll out the red carpet to each and every person that wants to come here. And this is not our position. We believe in external borders, protecting them fully in line with fundamental rights. That goes without saying. And we believe that Frontex plays a crucial role in that. We gave them a strong mandate. They're going to grow to 10,000 border guards on the ground. And we need to make sure that they can focus all their efforts on making that mandate into an operational reality. Too much time has been spent on internal chaos at Frontex. We have read the report. The main persons of interest responsible for that chaos are uh, taking the consequences. So with a new executive director, we also have to make sure with our support that the agency can make a fresh start and perform its crucial role. Thank you. We'll now take your questions, starting here for Eudora. Hi, um, I am Eleonora Vasquez from Euractive. I have a question on migration. The Parliament, the Council and the Commission announced a roadmap about different files and policies to approve uh, within the next uh, European elections. And uh, among these files, there is also the Pact of uh, Asylum and Migration. My question is, uh, uh, do you think it's feasible to uh, approve uh, this pact uh, before uh, the next European elections? And uh, um, in what extent the EPP will commit uh, that, uh, to, to approve this file? Thank you. It is absolutely feasible. I mean, the, it's been quite some time since the Commission has presented these proposals. So the Parliament should be able, by the end of the year, to adopt a position 
on all the legislative files that make up the Pact on Migration. This is our commitment, and we will work on this. But we also need the help of the other groups to make that into a reality, and I hope you can also ask them the same question. And it is absolutely, I mean, it would be such a, 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 a loss of, of potential if you, again, go into a European election without having solved the main issue that is on the minds of so many European citizens. So yes, we need to commit, we need to solve this, and we need to make sure that before the next European elections, we have a working European system. But again, we need all political groups in this House to achieve that. Laura. Hi. Um, Laura Zornoza from FA. I have two questions, one for each of you. The first one to the Chairman um, on the abuse of Article 122 from the Commission uh, um, skipping Parliament in many decisions. What exactly are the steps that Parliament is taking? Because this is uh, a concern that you've expressed in the past. I think Irache has also expressed in the past. Um, is, are there conversations with the Commission regarding the, the abuse of this uh, procedure? What, what can be done about it? And uh, to Mr. Lenares, if possible, a question on PEGA, on the PEGA committee, which you are a chair of. I was wondering if you could give us um, a bit of a, you know, to sum up the process so far, um, say maybe when the report could be, the draft report could be ready. What's your um, assessment of how it's going so far? Thank you. So for the Article 122, so, I said it also in my State of the Union speech that if this would happen on national level, that you have a windfall tax decided, uh, that you have a cap on gas price decided uh, without uh, involving the national parliament, uh, everybody would heavily criticize this even as a rule of law problem. I would not go so far because, again, it is a current treaty, so it allows the 122 is a, is a legal base for these kind of initiatives. So we are in talks to each other. We discuss the issues together. And as Parliament, we uh, insist that the Commission must come back to a reasonable approach, like they do it also with the uh, uh, electricity price regulation. So there we have already a positive momentum there. And let me add to the, uh, to the, energy, uh, to the migration debate, having in mind what, uh, what Jerome said uh, is, you know, having in 2015, the migration crisis really became the top issue and created a lot of populism all over Europe. We know this. And having now in mind that the Council, the Czech Presidency, is really ready to deliver, they are ready to negotiate, they are ready to start the dialogue. And the European Parliament is due to party political egoism and also to ideologically driven uh, 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 perspective, not capable to answer this. I have to say that some parties of the left side are fueling with their resistance, with their incapability to uh, deliver on this subject, they are fueling populism today. And that's why we really want to insist and we really want to urge the others now to speed up that we are at the end of this, uh, of this uh, Czech presidency are really ready for the negotiations on such an important file. It would be a major, a major success for all Europeans if we can deliver until the next European elections on this, on this important file. Uh, yes, on, on Pega, I, I hope you have an hour because uh, if you ask me about an update of what we have done, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to express it in a very short amount of time. We had a, a huge amount of, of hearings with experts, with representatives of, of member states' governments, with victims, with lawyers, with legal experts, um, technical experts. And the idea is that uh, the rapporteur will present the draft report in the week of the 7th of November. So that will be the first draft. And we need to conclude it, uh, our, our work by March 2023. 20, uh, um, what I do notice is that there is a, a very um, great diversity in the cooperation we receive from member states. There are member states who are very willing to cooperate with our committee, who see the value of tackling this kind of abuse of spyware at the European level and are open to do this with us. Uh, to give two examples, maybe, we visited Poland, where we did not receive any cooperation from the Polish authorities whatsoever, which is also, I think, a, a telling sign of how serious they take uh, parliamentary dialogue, democratic checks and balances in general. But we came back from that extremely shocked. I think I speak on behalf of all political parties, extremely shocked about the lack of any kind of checks and balances in the Polish state, which also is a context where abuse of a, um, a technology like Pegasus can thrive. 
we will travel to Greece and Cyprus in, um, in the beginning of November. And the Greek government already has sent some experts to our hearing we had on Greece. And for November, uh, they have assured us that we will get all the high-level meetings that we uh, request on the relevant topics with the relevant uh, high-level representatives of the government. So I think it's very important that we also, again from this stage, make a call on all member states, including member states like Poland and Hungary, to cooperate with the committee and to make sure that we can do our work. Is there any other follow-up? Yeah, um, on the missions, you have three Spanish MEPs that are affected uh, by it and, and another one that's indirectly affected and a potential um, hearing on just the Spanish case. Are you, what are your, are you planning on a mission to Spain as well or is this being discussed? Uh, a potential mission to Spain has been discussed. We, we are uh, running um, against the limits of our, our mandate because we only have a limited uh, possibilities for uh, missions and the coordinators of the groups had decided that the, the, the missions that we wanted to do were Israel uh, because of the, the logical uh, links with the NSO group. We wanted to go to Poland, uh, Greece, and then combined with Cyprus and Hungary. And if there is room for an additional mission, then again there will be a discussion on, on where this should be. And then there is Spain is one option, uh, the UK, uh, Morocco, US, there are several options, so it's not uh, decided yet. Any other question? Um, bonjour. Uh, Anna Vendensky from Europe Diplomatic. I have a question on our perspective of creating an energy hub in Turkey. Uh, would be that a solution? Because it's a great interest to this development. Would you see that it will resolve uh, partially the problems uh, European Union has now with Russia in terms of delivery of Russian gas and oil? Well, on the energy side, we are looking for, uh, we are open for all solutions because we are under pressure, obviously. So there we need partners. We have to be uh, uh, creative on this as well. But especially on the Turkish side, I think last week's uh, enlargement report from the Commission was also uh, stronger, was also more outspoken about our challenges, our problems. Also the Prague Summit gave us a clear idea that we have there growing tensions between Turkey and the European Union as a whole. Uh, that's why um, I think on the, on the concrete uh, relationship with Turkey, we need a broader perspective on, on, the, upcoming, on the upcoming developments. For us as EPP group, it's also clear that um, this provocation, this uh, ongoing escalation of the conflicts in the region are also linked to the domestic politics uh, in Turkey. And uh, uh, we should be united and should be outspoken about our re request towards our Turkish friends that this cannot go on, this cannot go on. And again, Greek uh, problems and Cyprus problems are European problems for us. Is there any other question? Or oh, we will end the briefing here, just in Good. time for the next Nobody one. has a question then. I want to express that I am really happy that after yesterday we have another prime minister in the ranks of the EPP. I was expecting some Swedish questions, but nobody's asking <laughs> them. So I'm really happy about this, and I have full trust that Lof Christensen will chair a government in, in, in Sweden which is fully covered by pro-European thinking, which is fully covered by pro-Ukraine thinking, and will also be a defender of rule of law. So we have a strong new government in Sweden, and for me as EPP president, it's good news. So thank you so much. Thank you very much.